Hey everybody, so today we're going to be covering chapter 36, discussing multi-system trauma as well as trauma within special patient populations. In this chapter we'll review what exactly multi-system trauma is, um, how we assess multi-system trauma as well as some various special patient populations such as uh, pregnancy, geriatrics, um, pediatric patients. Now when, mul when multiple body systems are involved in any kind of trauma, it makes managing this patient more challenging because now not, in this, not only is the skin and the bones affected, but now possibly the cardiovascular system, the gastrointestinal system, or even the neurological system is involved as well. And when dealing with our special populations, whether it's a pediatric, a geriatric, a pregnant patient, or even someone who's cognitively impaired, it, it there's some things that you want to take into consideration when you're going through your assessment as well as managing these patients that way we could treat them appropriately and most effectively now for multi-system trauma as I just talk, discussed this is when more than one of our major body systems are involved so something other than just the skin or something other than just the mus this, uh, our bone structure. Now it's our gastrointestinal system, our urinary system, uh, endocrine, renal, cardiovascular, pulmonary. We've got a lot going on now. Now in order for this to occur, in order for multiple systems to be involved, something significantly had to happen to this patient in order for it to occur. So because of this, because multiple systems are being involved, there's a higher likelihood of multiple sites bleeding out. Our chances of shock developing is much higher when dealing with multi-system trauma patients. Now care for these symptoms, it ultimately depends on the systems involved. If we have a patient that's with skeletal trauma, we need to treat the fractures. If we have pulmonary, we need to focus on breathing uh, or treat the breathing as well. If it's cardiac, we treat it. Ultimately, for these patients, nine, probably nine times out of ten, the, the definitive care for these patients is surgical intervention. If we have a patient with that the cardiovascular system is involved and we have a cardiac tamponade, they need to surgically go in and suture that tamponade to stu suture the where it's bleeding out so that way now the, the heart can perfuse properly if we have a pneumothorax we generally need to go they generally need to go in and possibly have to surgically repair the lung if we have issues within the gastrointestinal system where now we have a ruptured spleen they have to go in and surgically repair that spleen Now we have some golden principles when dealing with any, with multi-system trauma care. Obviously the number one concern is your safety, the safety of your partner and all personnel and the excuse me and the patient. From the time you arrive on scene all the way throughout the care cuz if there's multi-system trauma it, like I said previously there's a significant force that had to be involved so there is a chance of if you're not careful, you getting injured as well. Once you're arriving on scene, determining if additional resources are needed. Could you need uh, the fire department on scene to help with extrication? Could you need PD on scene because of a shooting or to help secure the scene? Um, do you need additional ambulance crews because of multiple patients? You want to have an understanding of the kinematics that led into the incident occurring. So having an understanding and knowing what your mechanism of injury is can help you anticipate, based off the kinematics of the MOI, what potential injuries the patient could be suffering from. Whether it's due to blunt force trauma, uh, penetrating trauma, motor vehicle collision, an explosion, deceleration type injury, or any uh, type or combination of these mechanisms. You also want to ensure that you're managing their airway and ventilation and oxygenating the patient as well. 
because the by managing these appropriately is key to successfully managing these patients. Always remember A, B, and C. Each multi-system trauma patient should be assessed and that patient's specific emergency care needs identified. If they have any external hemorrhaging, we need to control it appropriately. Start with pressure dressing or pressure gauze. If that doesn't work, then we need to apply what? Right, we need to apply a tourniquet. Uh, if once you go through your ABCs, try to go through your secondary assessment. Try to find any additional injuries that could potentially be life-threatening that you didn't see during your primary assessment. If the patient is able to talk to you, get a, your history from them. If they're not able to see a family or if families around that can get you get that history from any injuries that you might find that need splinting splint them as appropriate and if spinal precautions are needed take them some of these times some of the times we might find these patients standing sitting prone or supine when we arrive on scene so you want to make sure that if they need spinal precautions spine motion restriction that we appropriately take care of it and secure them to a board appropriately. If you're having to take rapid extrication and rapid transport of a critical, critically injured multi-system trauma patient are essential. The on-scene time is critical and should not be prolonged. The on-scene time is considered part of your platinum 10 minutes and the golden period between injury and definitive care at the hospital, um, a time span that should not be exceeded and should be minimized if possible. With uh, pregnant patients, you want to. There's some considerations you want to take. For one, it is very difficult for us to assess the fetus. I cannot tell if there's any distress going on with that fetus. I don't have ultrasound capabilities. So anything that we might suspect, if we suspect any injury to that fetus, we want to manage the mother aggressively. Even if she's satting 94% sat uh, on room air, if you suspect any kind of abdominal trauma, go ahead and put her on non-rebreather. Because just because she's satting 94 does not mean that baby is satting 94%. Injury to a pregnant uterus can also result in severe bleeding because the blood volume is generally increased by 50% during the, the last stages of pregnancy. These changes can make the injured pre pregnant patient more susceptible to shock. However, because of this increased plasma volume, the signs of shock may be masked and or delayed. Their renal blood flow is also increased. So even damage to the kidney could be drastic. They're more likely of uh, falls and for lower back pain because the pelvic joints are loosened and their center of gravity changes. Both of, uh, like I said, both of which can make them prone to accidents and falls. They, if you pay attention to them, as their uh, stomach, as their abdomen is getting bigger as the baby continues to grow, they start leaning back to help try to center off their gravity, to create a better center of gravity. Their diaphragm is more elevated because the, as the baby continues to grow, it forces, it's forcing up into the thoracic cavity. So now the, pa the mother can't breathe as well, so that's why her respiratory rate increases. Their uterus and bladder are more anterior and superior than normal. So these are at greater risk of injury as well during a pregnancy as well. Trauma to a pregnant woman, whether severe or minor, can have potential significant effects on the health of the fetus. The death rate of the fetus is much higher. It's up to nine times more likely for her, the fetus to die than the maternal, than the mother following any kind of trauma. 
So that's why we want to treat them much more aggressively. If there is any complaint of abdominal pain or contractions, we need to assess for crowning or vaginal bleeding because they may have be going through, uh, it may have caused them to go into labor. Abruptio placenta can commonly occur also with blunt force trauma. With these patients, there may be abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding. When this occurs, we need to quickly get them to the hospital because surgical intervention is potentially needed. And there is a high risk of, fe of fetal and maternal death rates with eruptio placenta. When it's much more favorable when a mother gets into a motor vehicle accident for both the maternal and fetal outcome when they have a seatbelt on. The unbelted pregnant crash victim is twice as likely to have vaginal bleeding or to give birth, and fetal death is three to four times more likely. And they will have to have the seatbelt properly placed. A lot of times, it's not comfortable for them to have it where it's supposed to be, so they'll, they may uh, put it on, over their stomach or not wear it at all. This is a greater chance of abdominal trauma to the fetus and, and have devastating effects to both the mother and the fetus. You can also have uterine rupture as a result of motor vehicle trauma where the uterus ruptures and now the infant is now exposed to the abdominal cavity. Because of the increased blood flow, because of the increased pulse rate and everything else that goes on because of the mother being pregnant, Shock is a frequent cause of death to both the fetus and the mother. It is estimated that 41% of fetuses die when the mother suffers a life-threatening injury. A traumatic maternal cardiac arrest poses a significant risk to the fetus. Although the chances of the fetus surviving maternal cardiac arrest is poor, it is still possible especially with high quality CPR. So even if the mother's gone if she is in cardiac arrest we st if we know that she's pregnant we still work it work it all the way to the hospital because potentially even if the mother is not uh, cannot be saved it is possible for them to do an emergency c-section get that fetus the baby out of the, the uterus start resuscitative care on that unborn on the fetus and possibly save that baby as well When taking spinal motion restriction, if you're having to place the pregnant patient on the spine board, we want to tilt it to the left to get the fetus off the inferior vena cava to uh, prevent the p uh, potential for supine hypotensive syndrome. You should anticipate as well vomiting and have suction readily available, especially when you're having to place them supine. Assess if they are breathing adequately and if bilateral breath sounds are present. If they are not breathing adequately, assist their ventilations with positive pressure ventilation. Administer a high concentration of oxygen via non rebreather if the breathing is adequate or via bag valve mask in those that are breathing inadequately. The vasoconstriction response in hypovolemia or shock excuse me, will reduce the blood flow to the uterus. The fetus is now vulnerable to any reduction in oxygen and can become severely hypoxic before the pregnant patient shows signs of hypoxia. That's why we want to, if we have a pregnant patient, place them on that high flow oxygen quickly. So that we can, even though she's satting okay, does not necessarily mean that the fetus is. Perform a visual examination at, at the vaginal opening, assess for any crowning and her bleeding. And remember that it, you have two patients if she goes into labor. If labor occurs because of the trauma, you may need additional resources to help you manage both the mother and the newborn. Consider calling for ALS or even for air transport for any major trauma involving a pregnant patient. 
And the best method to care for the fetus is by anticipating injuries and shock and aggressively managing the mother. Uh, some findings that may be prompt for you to suspect abuse in pediatric patients um, depends on the mechanism, such as bruises or burns, injury that doesn't seem to correlate with the cause provided or the developmental stage of the patient, more injuries than usual for a child that same age, multiple injuries in various healing stages, and delay in seeking emergency care. Children are at a great risk of being abused, whether it's due to uh, blunt force trauma, burns, or even emotional. Now, other mechanisms that pediatric patients may be involved in include drownings, motor vehicle accidents, penetrating trauma, and pedestrian versus vehicle collisions. They may also have uh, brain, they are more susceptible to brain injury, specifically due to shaken baby syndrome, where unfortunately mom or dad gets tired of the baby cr uh, crying and they're getting fed up, they let their emotions get the better of them, and they start shaking the baby back and forth. Not only will it cause severe brain trauma, but it can also cause cervical trauma to the infant as well. An improperly placed lap belt across the abdomen of a pediatric patient can lead to a compression fracture of the thoracolumbar vertebrae in a rapid deceleration motor vehicle crash in pediatric patients. The high displacement of the ribcage and internal organ placement makes them more susceptible to injuries to the spleen and liver. Greater chest wall flexibility can allow for internal chest injuries with few external signs of trauma. They also have a higher metabolic rate, which require a greater amount of oxygen and glucose to be constantly delivered to their cells. Traumatic forces are also more widely distributed within pediatric patients than in adults because of their shorter stature, thus making them more prone to suffering multi-system trauma. When assessing the, a pediatric trauma patient, we use what's called the Pediatric Assessment Triangle to help us form our general impression. Now, both the PAT and the PALS assessment, which PALS is what um, your ALS providers use, it collects the same information in the general impression of the pediatric patient. We're looking at the appearance or consciousness component, referring to assessing the child's overall mental status, whether unresponsive, irritable, their body position, as well as muscle tone. The breathing component relates to the work of breathing as determined by a visual assessment of the effort of breathing, absence of breathing, or decreased respiratory effort, plus any audible sounds associated with respiration. The circulation or color component is assessed by observing the patient's skin color, whether it's cyanosis, pallor, or model modeling. The brachial pulse should be assessed in an infant less than one year of age. Because the myocardium is immature, the pediatric patient's ability to increase cardiac output depends primarily on raising the heart rate. Therefore, tachycardia is the earliest and most sensitive sign of hemorrhagic shock within the pediatric patient. If they have a slow heart rate, it may indicate hypoxia, so we need to prevent, provide high, quality, uh, high concentration of oxygen to increase their oxygen saturation. Also, because of pediatric patients' um, sizes of arms and because of size of pressure of blood pressure readings, it can be difficult to obtain this in children younger than three years of age. When taking um, spine motion restriction, remember because of their head being proportionally larger than their body, you may you need to make sure that you pad underneath the shoulders to raise the shoulders and the hips to prevent neck flexion 
and any child under the age of 8. Assess the breathing rate and tidal volume. Keep in mind that what is considered a normal respiratory rate and tidal volume are age and weight dependent. Look at both the chest and the abdomen when doing so. Carefully provide ventilations and if either the rate or tidal volume is inadequate or if bradycardia is present. Pediatric trauma patients can fatigue quickly. Administer supplemental oxygen to maintain an O2 sat of 95% or greater. Most of the management for a pediatric trauma patient is going to be the same as for adults. The only difference is when you're looking at vital signs. So if you have any bleeding, you're going to treat it just like that of an adult. If you have signs of shock, we treat it the same as that of an adult. Cover them up, high flow oxygen, rapid transport to an appropriate facility. And then obviously continuously reassess as appropriate. With geriatric patients, the most common injury that you'll see with them is falls. Which, with falls, the most common uh, result is them to have a fracture. Behind that, motor vehicle, motor vehicle collisions are the second most common cause of trauma in the elderly. Older drivers are more likely to be killed or injured in these accidents than younger drivers because of the uh, pathological changes within their body as they continue to age. A lot of time these falls are due to secondary to some type of medical condition causing them to have a syncopal episode and falling and hitting their head. Geriatric patients are more susceptible to injury than old, old other adults even in cases of minor trauma. Minor chest trauma can cause severe lung injury in the geriatric patient. Decreased muscle size in the abdomen can mask abdominal trauma within the elderly as well. Thinner skin in the elderly also results in more easily inflicted soft tissue injuries. Thus, because of these changes to the pulmonary, the cardiovascular, the neurological, the musculoskeletal, the GI, GU, all of the body systems that the changes occur while they're aging, it makes the... It, injuries more likely and harder for us to assess and for the patient to compensate for when these injuries occur. When we're assessing them we want to take a look at any pre-existing conditions that they may have as well as the medications that they're taking because these can drastically affect the outcome and the assessment of the patients. Such as for a patient going into shock, one of the early signs is they'll be tachycardic but a normal blood pressure. Well, if they're taking medication to slow their heart rate down, we won't be able to assess for that tachycardia. Chest wall injuries can also quickly lead to respiratory failure in this population. You should monitor the elderly trauma patient's uh, oxygenation using pulse oximetry. Elderly patients who are hypertensive prior to an injury may have normal blood pressure readings while they are in shock. Also, look at their airway. Make sure that you look closely at their airway if they have dentures. If their dentures are loose, remove the dentures. Prevent hypothermia, splint fractures as appropriate. Remember that traction splints are not used to treat hip fractures and tra provide rapid transport to the closest appropriate facility. Make sure that you use padding when packaging the patients to a board as necessary to prevent breakdown of the skin. With patients that have some type of cognitive impairment, they are also more subject to trauma. Conditions such as dementia, autism, Alzheimer's, Down syndrome, and stroke are all those that would be considered a cognitive impairment. Where it is, and these affect how we assess and manage the patients. It can be difficult at times to recognize patients with cognitive impairment when you begin your assessment. Some patients have no physical signs of their mental condition. With Down syndrome patients, they may have mild to moderate developmental impairment and they may not be able to give you an accurate history. So we may have to rely on a parent or other caregiver to help reassure the patient and provide information about their history. Some patients with dementia experience cardiovascular changes as well that make them prone to injury. 
Other patients have a loss of musculoskeletal strength due to aging or impairment that can lead to falls and other injuries. Memory loss from Alzheimer's disease or other cognitive impairments can alter the patient assessment as well. Also, due to aging and not they may have um, sensory loss because of demyelination of certain areas of the brain. The psychological implications of trauma can also be different in this population. Many of these patients do not know what is happening even before the trauma. They may be confused or more upset. The traumatic event can even make it more difficult for them to communicate and cooperate with you. Your trauma assessment provides the most pertinent information about your patient. Because many of these patients are not able to tell you what is wrong, it is important that you constantly reevaluate them. Because of various issues such as diabetes, stroke, uh, or it's due to some type of neurocognitive disorder, their perception of pain may be altered. So you want to make sure that you do a very thorough assessment. A lot of times these patients require special care, so involve their caregivers to help out with you and to increase cooperation of the patient. Err, always err on the side of caution and treat as if the patient has a head injury if they have any signs of altered mental status. Unresponsiveness or altered mental status, especially in trauma patients, should always suggest the possibility of head injury. Never assume that mental status changes in a trauma patient are due to drug or alcohol intoxication or previous medical conditions. However, caregivers can give insight into the patient's baseline mental state. Assess your patient's mental status using the AFPU mnemonic. Utilize tools such as your GCS and the PAT to provide additional information about the patient's mental state. This will give you a baseline when you go to reassess your patient. If, your patient, if you're needing to open up the airway, if you're taking spinal precautions, use a jaw thrust maneuver and be prepared to suction if they go to vomit. Any pregnant patient in their 20th week of gestation or greater who has any trauma, even minor, should receive a high concentration of oxygen regardless of SpO2 reading. Although the pregnant patient may not have any signs or symptoms of hypoxia, this reduction in blood flow to the uterus during compensated shock can cause the fetus to become, more, to become severely hypoxic. For your pediatric patients, if they are bradycardic, we need to provide positive pressure ventilation because it is most likely due to hypoxia that they are uh, bradycardic. During your secondary exam assessment, you want to go through your rapid secondary head-to-toe assessment. If they're in your special populations, you want to anticipate any abnormal reactions that may be because of their condition. And make sure when you're looking at the vital signs that you take into consideration the age and comorbid conditions of the patient. Go through your history. This can provide vital information about the mechanism of injury. When did it occur? What are your complaints, signs, and symptoms? Are you pregnant? If so, how far along is she? Patients, especially children, uh, those with cognitive impairments or those with an altered mental status may not be able uh, to provide you with the information you need. Special trauma patients may not respond to injury the same way that another trauma patient would. So you want to make sure that you document all of your signs and symptoms accurately. Remember, if you're taking inline stabilization for uh, pregnancy patients, especially third trimester, you want to tilt the backboard to the left to get the pressure off the inferior vena cava. For children younger than eight, pad from the shoulders to the hips to keep everything in line. Uh, if you're needing to maintain a patent airway, if with use a jaw thrust maneuver as appropriate, administer oxygen and monitor your ABCs and look for signs of deterioration. If major bleeding into an extremity is not stopped with direct pressure, apply a tourniquet. If while in route you want to notify the receiving facility specifically what type of trauma patient you're bringing to the facility so that way they can be prepared. Consider the use of ALS intercept or air transport for these patients 
and follow local protocol. All right, guys, that concludes the chap this chapter for the uh, for today. If you have any questions, make sure that you're doing a Brady Labs. If you have any questions, please send them to me either in Blackboard or in Remind, um, or write them down. We'll discuss it next time in class. Otherwise, y'all have a good rest of your day, and I will see y'all next time.